Okay, so um, okay, so um, a few years ago, there was a huge amount of activity in creating nanostructured materials. Yeah, so lots and lots of money and many research groups working on the problem of creating extremely small grain sizes. And frankly speaking, none of them succeeded. They could produce. Uh, material this size with very severe deformation, but not actually produce things which can be made on a large scale. So today I'm going to tell you about the story of the first bulk nanostructured metal ever created. Okay, and what do we mean by nanostructure? Twenty thirty. Uh, so, he says the nanostructure is a grain size of the order of 10, 20 to 30 micrometers. Uh, but say, you know, if you go back to aluminum alloys, we have the GP zones, which are tiny precipitates. Is that a nanostructure? Why not? So, by nanostructure, uh, we mean that there should be a very large density of interfaces not simply that we have small particles. So for example, aluminum is not very strong. But if you had a very high density of interfaces, that means the amount of surface per unit volume, then that would be really strong. Okay? Right, so imagine that we have to design a bulk nanocrystalline steel, which is very cheap, strong, and tough. You know? So it's like having a cake with all the characteristics that you like. So tell me, what do you mean by bulk? What does bulk mean? Large size. Hmm? Large size. Large size. How large? Yeah, and in all dimensions, right? So. I'm not talking about making extremely thin sheet by severe deformation or drawn wire, okay? But we want something which is very big. So this is the size of uh, a human being here, okay? And this is a truck which I photographed in Alberta, in Canada, where they mine oil by digging out oil-rich sand, okay? So we want it to be big, and we want it to be big in all dimensions. Not, not simply sheet or wire, but you can make it large in all dimensions. Okay, uh, what do you mean by nanocrystalline? 20, 30 micrometers is huge, yeah? This is uh, a carbon nanotube, yeah? So most people would call this a nanotube, and the dimensions here are of the order of 20 nanometers. So we've got to make crystals inside very large lumps of steel, uniformly 20 to 40 nanometers in size. And what do we mean by cheap? How cheap is cheap? Yeah. Comparable to the? Comparable, Comparable to what? Hmm. But what do you buy every day? which you don't need to buy, yeah, so you're wasting money. So if you can afford to waste money, then it's cheap, right? So what do you buy on a hot day? Bottle of water, right? Now, bottle of water is the most clever marketing campaign in the world, right? You can get perfectly good water from the tap, but you will buy bottled water which has been transported over many, many miles in a plastic bottle which is made out of oil, yeah? And then you will be happy to drink that instead of the water from the tap, yeah? So in Korea, I only drink from the tap. Yeah, I don't drink from the machines which are designed to give you cold water or from bottled water. Drink from the tap is perfectly okay to do so. So you can afford to waste money on this. Therefore, the price uh, of our steel should be comparable 
to that of bottled water, weight for weight or volume for volume. Okay? If you make it more expensive than that, then people will not buy your bulk nanocrystalline steel. Okay? So that's the price that we are aiming for. Now, in order to explain to you what units really mean, you, know, you talk about megapascals, there are million pascals, right? Now, the weight of one apple is approximately one newton. Newton is a force, so the weight is one newton. You put it onto a square meter, that's one pascal. So, a hundred megapascals means you have a hundred million apples on one square meter. Okay? And one gigapascal means you have a billion apples on one square meter. Okay? So, remember what strength means. It's not small. It's, we are aiming for even 100 megapascals is very strong. But we want to go much higher than that into gigapascals and terapascals. Right? The terapascals is a thousand billion apples on one square meter. So, you just get apple juice at the bottom. Okay? Right. Now, this is going back to 1956 where we could make uh, steel or iron which is 10 gigapascals strong. Yeah, you can see here, 10 gigapascals. And the strength, in theory, is about 22 gigapascals. You can make iron as strong as 22 gigapascals. But these are single crystals, all right? So these are whiskers of iron. And their strength comes from the fact that you don't have defects when you make a sample small. Right? You don't have dislocations, for example. So you have to nucleate them, and therefore you have a very high strength. Right? So as soon as you make such a particle bigger, the strength collapses. Right? And this has been known since 1956, okay, that as soon as you start to rely on perfection in order to get strength, you will not be able to scale up the object. So, instead of getting strength by making something perfect, you can, in fact, get strength by severely introducing defects, right? Large densities of defects. So, if you take of uh, steel, say 56 grams, and you stretch it out into two kilometers, that's a true strain of about nine. And this is what has been done to this uh, steel wire which is commercially available at a strength of 5.5 gigapascals, five and a half billion apples on one square meter, and you have ductility. Yeah? So you can't do this, for example, with carbon fiber. Yeah? You have a lot of ductility. Uh, but just to illustrate to you the problem with severe deformation, the size of this wire, if I compare with things that you know. Uh, f first of all, this is just a field iron micrograph where each dot is a single atom. And what you're seeing is that the boundaries are very, very, uh, the size of the grains has become very small by this severe deformation. And that's where the strength comes from. Okay? Uh, but the dimensions of the wire, in order to appreciate them, you have to look at, uh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead, all right? So, this is comparing the single crystals where the strength collapses as you make the size bigger. Yeah. And this is where you get strength from defects. And it's no longer sensitive to size. Yeah. But this is a sock and these are women's stockings. And the traditional way of looking at the dimensions of thread is a denier. That means the weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber. Okay. So this is uh, approximately 10 denier, and this is 50 denier. And that wire is finer than the thread that goes into women's stockings. So you're not going to be able to make a bridge out of this. So the problem with severe deformation is that you limit the shape of the product that you produce. Now, Carbon nanotubes have incredible strength, 130 gigapascals. Yeah? It's, it's the strength made in dreams, but it's true. And the modulus along the length 
is about 1.2 terapascals. That's about six times that of steel. Yeah? So there was huge publicity about this. And people started talking a lot of nonsense. For example, that we, you know, look at this journal, Astra, Astronautica. That means you're looking at space. Yeah? So the idea of making an elevator to go into space. Now the problem with that is that all materials have a certain density. So you've got to make a rope which is about 100,000 kilometers long and its own weight will break it. Yeah? But if you have something as strong as 130 gigapascals, then you could in principle make it. Yeah? And the idea comes from a Russian comic from a long time ago, but not about carbon nanotubes. So can you see a difficulty? Sorry? Uh, so let's let's just uh, focus on strength. Can you see a difficulty? Go back to 1956. Yeah, as soon as you make the tube longer, there will be defects, and the strength collapses to less than that of steel. Yeah. So NASA spent 17 million dollars on this, and I sent them the paper that I wrote on this that fundamentally impossible to get that strength level in a large object because if you look at the energy of a defect and let's say we have defects that opposes the formation of a defect this entropy term favors the formation of a defect yeah because when you introduce a foreign object you know the number of ways of counting increases so you get to an equilibrium concentration of vacancies, which depends on the free energy of formation of that defect. So this is a thermodynamic principle. There is no manufacturing process which can avoid it. So if you are getting strength from something perfect, that will not appear when the material becomes larger. And that also applies to graphene. Yeah. OK. Um, so the strength of whiskers of iron decreases with size and the strength of a nanotube rope which is only two millimeters long is less than that of steel. Okay? So there's no way you can make a space elevator. So to summarize, strength that is produced by deformation limits the shape and strength in small particles which relies on perfection is doomed. Doomed means it won't happen. Right, this is a grain structure, and uh, this is the shape of a grain in three dimensions. It's a tetrachidodecahedron, right? So it's a space-filling object, uh, and back in the 1960s, there was a huge development in steels, which we discussed earlier. It was the microalloying, which led to a dramatic decrease in the grain size and improvement in toughness and strength. And there are something of the order of 50 billion tons of steel in the world in service today, which you do not need to worry about. Yeah? Nobody knows about them. They are so good and reliable that you don't need to think about it. It's not like your operating system of your computer. Yeah? Very badly engineered. OK, so that thermomechanical processing routinely produces grain sizes of 10 micrometers in hundreds of millions of tons of steel every year. When you, ref oops, when you refine the grain size, there is a cost because you are introducing more grain boundary per unit volume. Okay. So that cost is the amount of surface per unit volume multiplied by the interfacial energy. And that must come from somewhere, you know, from the driving force for transformation. And when you did perlite, you realize that the amount of surface per unit volume is 2 divided by the spacing between the boundaries. Yeah? So this is the grain size, this is the interfacial energy per unit area, and that's the cost that you have to provide from the driving force. So if I um, look at the commercial steels that are available after huge amounts of research done to reduce the grain size, they are basically stuck at this point, right, about one micrometer. But according to that equation here, when I equate this cost against the driving force, okay, so the driving force is given over here, 
I should be able to get to really, really small sizes. But there's a problem when you're looking at large quantities of material. When you get a phase transformation, the material heats up yeah, because you can't dissipate the heat fast enough. And that is why we are stuck at around one micrometer. Cannot get it smaller than one micrometer because if you undercool the material, you will get a large amount of heat released, enthalpy change, and therefore you're back to a higher temperature and you do not get the fine grain size. And this process is called recalescence. This is the heat capacity, this is the enthalpy change. The larger the enthalpy change, the the temperature rise. Okay. So it's not going to be possible using thermomechanical processing to produce grain sizes in this range. Even though theoretically, you know, if you could take away the heat, that would be possible. Okay. So we've got to find a mechanism of taking away the heat of transformation. Right, so that heat of transformation, when you take account of that, gives you another set of curves, which indicates that you're not going to get lower than about 0.1 of a micrometer. Okay, so thermomechanical processing is limited by recalescence. Recalescence means the heating up of the steel by the itself. Yeah? So what we need to do is we need to store somehow the heat of transformation inside the steel. And one way to limit that uh, problem is to allow the heat to diffuse away. So if the rate of transformation is small, then again the problem is reduced. But we are sure that we need to transform at a low temperature because you need the driving force to create the boundaries. Yeah? Just like in perlite, you know, you can predict the minimum spacing, critical spacing, when all the driving force is consumed. Similarly, there's a minimum grain size here given the amount of driving force. And the lower the temperature, the more driving force you have. So these are the design principles, but there is one more, okay, which is illustrated by this graph from the literature, Suji's work, where as you refine the grain size, you lose ductility. Right? And basically the work hardening mechanism disappears. Because when you have a small grain size, dislocations sink into the boundaries. So you're left with no mechanism of work hardening. And therefore, you get plastic instability immediately, you know, you have some plasticity. So we need to introduce a mechanism of work hardening, right? Uh, in addition to all the other three conditions that we have. And what is the mechanism of work hardening that you know, which is very effective? Dislocations are necessary, but is there a clever mechanism? Hmm? Yeah, but, but you know, if we make a fine grain size, the dislocations will disappear into the boundaries. So what other mechanism do you know of work hardening? Yeah. So we need some austenite, right? Okay, so this you're familiar with. This is the shape deformation of bainite. And you know that it causes a lot of strain energy. That reduces the heat of transformation. So you need a displacive transformation because the uh, stored energy due to the elastic strains is quite large. You know, you use the numbers somewhere. Uh, between 400 and 700 joules per mole is a very large energy. If you, if you go back to the graph where I had the free energy plotted, you know, you can see the stored energy due to the displacements is actually very large. So if you utilize displacive transformations, then the recalescence problem is reduced because you store the heat of transformation. And we are going to produce extremely cheap austenite yeah, because we are limited to the cost of bottled water. So, you know, forget about nickel. So we do that by partitioning carbon into the austenite. And of course, we, we don't want cementite because when you're dealing with very strong steels, the cementite itself is a cracked nucleation site. Right, so this is the structure you've seen before where the plates are about a quarter of a micrometer thick, but that's no good to us, yeah? We've got to go even finer. 
because we want to match carbon nanotubes, right? 20, 40 nanometers in thickness, right? So we need to reduce the transformation temperature. What is the lowest temperature at which bainite can form? It's limited by the martensite start temperature, but I can suppress martensite, right, by adding things. But what is the lowest temperature at which bainite can form? Yeah, there's no answer in the books, right? But we have the theory. So here are some calculations. So we've got to suppress the martensite start temperature. That's not a problem. Yeah, we have to do some alloying to reduce both the bainite and the martensite star temperature. And remember, this is in Kelvin, so this is room temperature. Okay, so if I add that much carbon, I can produce bainite at room temperature. There's no limitation. Yeah, uh, there's no fundamental limitation to producing bainite at a low temperature. But of course, we need something about kinetics. So if I make an alloy with that much carbon it will take me a hundred years, okay? Uh, so this is one year, and over there it will come to, this is a logarithmic scale. It will take me a hundred years at room temperature to produce bainite, yeah? Now, that's not really a problem. You know, when you make wine, you keep it for a very long time, and then it becomes very expensive, right? So all POSCO has to do is to produce a large quantity, keep it for a hundred years, and then sell it very, very expensive, right? But I want to see some results during my lifetime. So we make an oops, uh, we make an alloy that has about one weight percent carbon and will take 10 days to form bainite, right? 10 days at a very low temperature of 125 degrees centigrade or 200 degrees centigrade. What is the temperature at which you cook pizza? Yeah, so this is cooking the steel at in a pizza oven. Okay, so it's not expensive. All right, so here is the very simple design. We have about one weight percent carbon. The silicon is there to stop cementite precipitation, and we have elements to avoid higher temperature transformations. This is important. When you make large quantities of steel, it's not possible to avoid impurities such as phosphorus they will be there. When you make a strong steel, phosphorus is very bad because it goes to the austenite grain boundaries and then you get brittle embrittlement. So you can't avoid the phosphorus, so you add molybdenum and that will stop the phosphorus from going to boundaries. Okay, so there's an attraction between the molybdenum and phosphorus atoms. So it's a very simple uh, design where we need hard ability to avoid high temperature transformations. We have a reasonable transformation time. No uh, cementite. We've got a small amount of micro alloying to stop the austenite grains from growing very large and avoiding embrittlement by adding molybdenum, okay? And then we simply austenitize and transform, yeah? So this is the optical microstructure. Look at the scale there, 40 micrometers. It's a beautiful image, but it's not exciting, right? Because the scale is 40 micrometers. So I'm going to show you now a transmission electron micrograph, okay? Uh, and it is spectacular. Yeah, so are you, are you ready for this? You know, take a deep breath, <laughs> all right? So, uh, austenite, yeah. Okay, so are you ready? Okay. Look, this is a carbon nanotube. And these are crystals of bainite grown inside the steel at 200 degrees centigrade, 10 days. And these are the work hardening mechanisms that we put into the steel. Yeah? Just look at these. Never before have you had, you know, 20 nanometer size bainite crystals. And it's the thickness which matters because the mean free slip distance is simply twice the thickness of the plate. So it's a beautiful image, and the properties are also very good. So you, you can get quite large elongation and very high strength. And uh, in a steel which is, you know, not purified like aircraft quality steels, 
that is an impressive value of toughness, 45 megapascal root meters for strength levels of that sort. Yep. So, and, and, and you know, the bainite is actually very hard because of this very dense packing of interfaces produced by phase transformation alone, so you can make very large samples. So the density of interfaces is actually larger than most uh, equi-channel angular processing or, you know, shear deformations like this. Yeah. If you deform this material at a very high velocity, then the strength increases. Yeah. Uh, and for, for example, here it's reaching 10 gigapascals at high strain rates. Right? After 10 gigapascals, things get complicated because you get phase transformation into epsilon multi uh, epsilon ion and so on. Yeah. But supposing you looked at this, what application could you think of? Armor. Yeah. Should be very good for armor. Now this is the material being produced, okay? Uh, lots and lots of it. There are thousands of tons that have been produced. Of course, when you produce it, it cannot be in that condition because you cannot make a coil out of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, too strong. So there is clever technology in creating it in a softened state so that you can make the material and then you can unroll it and in the final condition, you give it the treatment required to produce the structure. And this is the armor. I can't tell you what is fired at it, yeah, because I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but I'm told that it is a very, very s severe test. And the proper way to measure is something called a ballistic mass efficiency, where you take your uh, mass of ordinary armor, Okay, uh, and divide by that of the test material to defeat the same threat. So you're taking account of density. And this material outperforms everything that we know. And it can take multiple shots, which ceramics can't. Okay. Now, this is a picture that I took in Heathrow Airport. Uh, and it was United Airlines. And when I was taking the picture, one of their staff came to me and said, you know, you should not be taking pictures. Yeah. So I said, where is the sign which says you should not be taking pictures? And she went away in a half. Yeah. But my point was, look, look at this aircraft engine. This is a relatively small aircraft engine. Look at this lorry. These are huge, right? And if you look inside the aircraft engine, that is steel, the shaft. Okay, very complicated and critical component is made from steel. And the reason why the front end is much bigger than the end is that most of the air doesn't pass through the engine. It passes around the engine and provides the thrust, and some of it is used to burn with fuel to create the thrust. Okay, so that thrust is driving these big fans which push the air. And the air also reduces the sound from the engine, which is important for civil engines. That's why military aircraft, yeah? You can't afford, military aircraft could probably fit inside the engine here, yeah? If they are small. They're basically an engine with wings, you know? So those are noisy, right? Because they don't have this air shielding the engine. And the idea is to make the entrance even bigger. That means the torque on the shaft increases, and we don't have the materials today for the future engines. So we are working on shafts with this uh, nanocrystalline bainite. So these are actually nanocrystalline bainite, and here it is being heat treated. This is austenitizing in Germany, and then you take it out and you put it into uh, a salt bath at 200 degrees centigrade, but you can't leave it there for 10 days. It's too expensive. So you take it out and you put it into a pizza oven for 10 days. Yep. Okay. Uh, here, here it is, the shaft. Now, when you talk about an armor, it's very easy to see its properties are suitable or not suitable. With an aircraft engine shaft, you need a lot more information. You know. Uh, fatigue, stress corrosion, 
the ability to quote it, the ability to join it, to machine it, and so on. So this will not happen quickly, but it is work in progress. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing this for the last five years. Hmm? How, oh, it, the machining is no problem. So in the aircraft industry, the cost is not important. Uh, within limits, all right? It's not important. So you use very special tools to make the oil channels and the links and so forth. That is no problem with this structure, yeah? But if you're talking about armor, uh, you can't use those techniques because it's too expensive, yeah? Right, so we have this structure. It, has, it is very strong and has uniform ductility. You saw the tensile curves, yeah? Uh, and uh, there's no deformation required to create this, so we can make any shaped object and no rapid cooling. And because there's no rapid cooling, you won't build in, you know, the rapid cooling stresses. Okay. And it's and uniform in large sections. You know, you saw the shaft is very big, right? So you get uniform hardness across the section. Right, so we go back to this graph. And I said to you that here it would take a hundred years to form the bainite, yeah? Okay? So we made this alloy in 2004. So the experiment has been running for 10 years. This is at room temperature. And there are two samples sealed inside quartz tubes with an inert atmosphere, polished metallographically. So if there is transformation, you can see it without breaking the tube. And one sample is in the Science Museum in London, and another one is in my office. The temperature in the Science Museum is much more controlled than in my office, okay? So that should be the reliable experiment. And we need another 90 years to confirm whether the theory is correct or not. So, you know, I expect you to tell this story to your children and your grandchildren. Yeah, otherwise my ghost will come and haunt you. <laughs> about the results, okay? So that's the end of the story today. And thank you all for attending the course, all right? So finish your assignment, and then I will pass on the marks to uh, whoever needs, them, needs to see them, okay? But you are doing very well. I, I looked at the marks, okay?